My name is Roy Ackmeyer. I'm an instructor over the Decent Department. I've worked here almost two years. For the 15 years before that, I was in fleet management, uh, operated uh, trucks, uh, fleet of just under 100 trucks. Uh, I worked as operations manager, maintenance director, safety director, several positions like this. So, uh, had lots of different titles. A lot of times we just you know, switching different hats. One time I was safety director, the next minute I was operations manager. So. Uh, I graduated from uh, Northwestern, that's Northwestern Oklahoma State University in Alva, Oklahoma, 1974. I got a BS in natural science, which means I studied to be a biology, chemistry, and physics teacher. And somebody asked me, well, how'd you end up in trucking? Well, teaching didn't pay real good at that time. Oil field did pay real good at that time. So uh, got into the oil field business, spent 15 years there, very, very successful. You're training for a technical career, and I think that's an excellent option, excellent place to get. Like you're going to have some good possibilities, good job waiting for you to get through. <coughs> I'd like to thank Student Center for having me over here, allowing me to speak to you for a little bit. Sometimes I get kind of on the soapbox and some of my classes over there and say, they should have taught you some of this stuff when you were in grade school and junior high and high school. How many of you have ever had an English teacher said, memorize this poem? Well, did, did you ever have an English teacher say, here's how to memorize? So there are some tricks and tips to memorize? Never did, did you? I didn't either. And like I said, I'm was trying to be a biology, chemistry, and physics teacher. Well, they didn't teach me any to teach my students. It was when I got into management position, was able to pay five or six hundred dollars to go to this seminar today, or three hundred dollars to go to these two-day seminar, whatever. When I became a professional in business, then I was allowed to go to some of these seminars where I was taught how to memorize. I didn't have time to waste. I need to look at something one time, know what it was, and be on about my business. How many of you have a lot of time to waste? Don't see very many hands up there. Okay, how many of you have decided to come to school here so you could be mediocre in your career? <laughs> well, I'm not getting very many responses. Of course, none of you came here to be me. You want to be the best you can be. You want to get the best education you can. You're spending the bucks to be here. You want to get the most out of your textbooks. It costs you $40, $50 a book. When you get into your business, you're going to be looking at different manuals, different rules, different regulations that you're going to have to keep up with. You don't want to have to go over and reread it, reread it, reread it. You want to know it when you read it and want to be there. When you read that history lesson tonight, you don't want to have to study it three more times. You want to be able to take the test and be done with it. You want to know it. So it does make a difference whether we're in a professional career or whether we're just taking classes. We don't have time to waste. So by learning some techniques, we can learn faster. How many of you here think you have fantastic minds? Every one of you is wrong. There have been lots of research done. Everything you have ever seen, everything you have ever read, everything you have ever done, everything you've ever heard, everything you've ever smelled is still there. But we often have a hard time recalling it, don't we? We all have fantastic memories if we train them a little bit. We have a hard time recalling it what we want sometimes. How many times have you ever got up and you're talking to somebody and said, oh yeah, I was with the, oh gosh, I know his name, but I can't think of it right now. And you stand there and talk a little bit and you still can't think of it and you walk off about a half a block, it comes back to you, didn't it? It was there all the time. You just couldn't get it recalled. So we're going to go through a few little tricks on recalling things. And I will tell you where to get some more information on it. Okay, let me give you a geography test. Okay, everybody ready for the geography test? Got your pen ready, pencil ready? Okay, write down the name of the five great lakes. <laughs> you 
You know, they're up here, up here in this corner of the United States. Five of them. Well, let me do something. Let's we'll see if this helps me. What's a great lake? You're on. What's another great lake? What's another great lake? It's another great lake. It's another great lake. So you knew the Great Lakes, didn't you? You remember that geography lesson you had clear back there, junior high, grade school? It just took something to help you recall it. That's a very simple little trick. And you probably all used something like that before, trying to memorize something. And it works very well for some limited things. Okay. I want to go over something we've all done. How many of you ever bought groceries? Yeah. Well, I have had one. Well, I'm going to make up a grocery list tonight so we can go buy groceries. Now, don't write these down. I want you to remember them. They're just going to be a short list. Okay, we want to get some watermelon. It's just about out of season, so let's get some before we can't get any. And we want about four of those big old baking potatoes, the ones you like with that sirloin steak. The big ones. And uh, we need a gallon of milk and some bread and I need some cereal for breakfast. Let's get some Frosted Flakes because you can kind of munch on those and eat them when you're watching TV too. And uh, some sausage. May have some company this weekend, so better get a couple pounds of sausage. Uh, some Longhorn cheese. Some strawberry ice cream. You might be able to tell that I enjoy ice cream. Uh, some frozen pizza. That way I'll have something to fix quick when I run home for dinner and lunch. And uh, some light bulbs. Need some light bulbs and some paper towels. And a TV guide. Okay, what was the fourth item? Bread? Yeah, I think it was bread. No. What was the first item? What was the last item? TV guide. We'll make a point right here and I'll make it again later on. We remember the first things and the last things we study best. We remember the first things and the last things you study best. So when you get ready to study, cram for that test over that two hour period, how many things are you going to remember? Probably the first thing and the last thing. So if we break that up into short periods, we've got more first and last, we remember more things. Okay, now we had a hard time with the grocery list there, but let me show you a trick to help you remember lists. This memory trick is one of many. It's called stacking. First thing I want to tell you is we don't remember in words. When you remember something, you don't picture a word up there, do you? You see a picture. So when you're trying to memorize something or trying to remember something, build a picture. The sillier it is, the easier it is to remember. Bring in smells, sounds, actions. The more senses we use, the more different places it's stored in our brain. You know, we've all seen, you know, drawing of the brain and it says, you know, your eyesight is here, and hearing's here, smells here. The more places we can store it, the better chance we have of getting it recalled, right? So we're gonna make a silly pitch. Now, when you go to the grocery store, first thing, grabs that shopping cart. And that one that I always grab a hold of is that one with that funny wheel. That... <laughs> Have you ever got a hold of that one? Okay. So we grab our shopping cart, we go down to the produce counter. And we find us a watermelon. It's already been cut in half. Oh, it looks bright red, juicy. It looks so good. We grab that watermelon. And it is so big that it won't even sit down in the basket. It's just sitting right there. On. Smell that watermelon? Can you smell it? Now, make a picture in your mind as we're going through here. Because we're going to be starting to stack. Okay, we walk on down the aisle here. We get down here a little ways, and we see those great big old baking potatoes. We want four of them. So we'll grab those baking potatoes. Just stab it in that water. Choo, choo, choo. It kind of looks like an upside down footstool now. Those potatoes sticking out of it. Have you got that picture in your mind now? Can you see that? You smell that watermelon as you're fishing along there? 
Okay, the next thing we needed was a gallon of milk. So we just grabbed that gallon of milk and we set it right there and bounce it on top of those four potatoes. Go on down through there ways. We need a loaf of bread. Okay, we'll grab that loaf of bread. You know where that handle is on that gallon of milk? We're going to shove that bread right through there. That way it won't fall out. Okay, we got it shoved up through there now. Now the next thing we're going to get was some frosted flakes. Now who's the uh, disposable for frosted flakes? Tony the Tiger. What's Tony the Tiger always say? Great. They're great. Well, this time he said, you're great. Well, that makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> well, just take old Tony and set him right up on top of that milk jug. His feet sitting there on top of that loaf of bread. Okay. Now, you got that picture in your mind? What have we got on our grocery list now? Hard time grocery list. <laughs> okay, well, Tony Tiger sitting up there on top of that milk jug and he's got something up in his eye. And remember, he's saying, You're great. And you thought she was talking about you. But he's not. He's got that two pound sausage up there looking through it like a telescope. And he's looking back across that field over there and back across over there. And what's he looking at? <laughs> Something else. We want some Longhorn cheese. Well, what what do you think when we think about Longhorn? Cow. Yeah. Well, we got a cow out there, a Longhorn cow, but that body is shaped like like that. You know, like long half round Longhorn cheese. It's yellow. You know what Longhorn cheese looks like? Okay, the next thing we're going to get was some ice cream. So we're going to get a big old dip. What kind of ice cream? Strawberry ice cream. And we're going to put that dip right up here because all those longhorn bulls have that big old hump over their shoulders, don't they? <laughs> so, and what, what color is that when it melts? Red. Strawberry ice cream. Kind of got a nice pink, you know, little red spots in there. That strawberry ice cream melting down over that shoulder of that longhorn bull. Now, what do bulls normally do when we see them out in the pasture? What do they normally do? Eating, aren't they? Well, this old boy like, puts his head down and brings it back up and instead in his mouth, what's he got instead of grass? He got some frozen pizza. <laughs> Chomping down on that frozen pizza. Okay, we look at that bull a little bit closer and we notice that on his head it looks kind of strange. He's got, you know, he's a longhorn, but they're straight. We were needing some light bulbs, weren't we? However, you know what these these light bulbs, fluorescent light bulbs, got big old fluorescent light bulbs sticking out of his head. <coughs> Next thing we need is some paper towels. What are we going to do with those paper towels? Let's we'll stick them right down on on those uh, fluorescent light bulbs. So those we've got two big old rolls of paper towels sitting right here. Okay. Now you know paper towels that have those nice little blue and pink flowers and bunny rabbits and all that stuff on it. Well, we pull down one of those paper towels, and instead of having those little pastel flowers on it, it's got TV Guide front covers. And it's got your favorite actor or actress on that TV Guide front cover. Do you see them there? Okay. Now, what do we have on our grocery list? What was the fourth thing? Bread. 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 Okay, we had think about it. Watermelon, potatoes, milk, bread. bread. What was the sixth thing? <coughs> Are you any smarter now than you were a couple minutes ago? No. Your brain's not any better now than it was a couple minutes ago. You simply learned a technique for recalling something. You've got a fantastic mind. You've got a fantastic mind. You just haven't been taught or have been shown some of these little tricks to make it easier to recall when you want to recall something. 
Now, a few minutes ago when I went through that grocery list, I went through it fairly slow. And everybody knew what the first one was, and everybody knew what the last one was, and the middle kind of got all jumbled up. But now you can give me that grocery list in a direct order, one side right after the other, can't you? Okay, let me give you another tip. How many of you ever were supposed to go by and pick up groceries, but you hopped in your car and went home, got home, and your wife, girlfriend, mother, dad, whatever said, did you pick up those groceries? <laughs> oh, no. Well, you know what we can do to help us remember that we need to pick up those groceries? How many of you have been at you know, a wedding where they really you know, put the uh, shaving cream or you know, something really nasty into those handles when they got to get into the car, you know, they really mess up the bride and groom's hands, you know, when they climb in? So well, think about that. And in your mind, spray that all over the handle of your car door. Now, when you walk out to your car and you grab that handle and you think about that mess that's all in your hand, of course, it's in your mind, isn't it? But you think about that mess, that reminds you that I'm supposed to do something. And then you can remember this list that you've built that you need to do. There's a lot more of these tricks out there. I do have a computer program that is shareware that I can make you copy of. It's called Memory Master. It costs $20 for you to register it. They say by the time you finish this program, if you go through it, you'll be able to look through a magazine and have it memorized. How would you like to be able to look through that chapter in that book you're supposed to read and I can have it memorized? Cool. It takes some time. <laughs> it takes some work to do it, but how much time is it going to save you over your lifetime? If you want me to make a copy of it, bring me a floppy disk over to the diesel department and write your name on it. I'll shoot a copy of it and bring it back. But it is available. There's stuff all around all over the place. Probably over in the library, there's different books on how to improve your memory. It won't work though if you don't practice with it. Now the picture we I built for you was silly, wasn't it? It was ridiculous. We had smells, we had sounds, you know, Tony the Tiger was talking. Use all the senses you can when you're trying to memorize something. <clears throat> okay. We've decided your memory isn't any better than it was a while ago, but you can remember a grocery list now. Now, the first one you try to build for yourself, you may be a little bit inhibited, and it may take you a little bit. But the more you practice, the easier it works. Okay. Turn in your notes there. The first page you believe you got is note taking skills. Now, I gave you some tips on memory. It didn't make you any smarter, or it didn't make your brain work any better. There's no better than it was a while ago. Now I'm going to give you some note taking skills. Now, these aren't big things, but it's not the big things that are important, it's the little things that are important. Every one of these may not work for you, so pick out a few of them and try them. If you find one that doesn't work for you, try another one. That's why I've got a page here that's got these things listed. Some of them may not work for you, some of them may. So give them a try. First thing I'd always recommend, and carry this on into your business practices, keep a notebook then. Always date your notes. Always date your notes. <coughs> keep different subjects in different notebooks keep different subjects in different notebooks. That way when you get ready to study you don't have three pages of history, one page of English, and you know, whatever. You get everything together in one place. If you keep these in your profession, then when the boss comes in and says, didn't I tell you last Thursday that we needed to get this done? And you continually write down what he says, and there wasn't there Thursday, no, you don't have a problem. You may have to hurry up and get it done, but at least he knows he didn't tell you. If you continually write down what you've been told you need to do. When you write down what you have accomplished in that notebook, some of those days when you're feeling down, we're all going to have those days, it's tough at work. 
we can look back on those notes and say, all right, look what I have been able to accomplish in this last week. I am a good person. I have done some good. This is what I've done. Also, you might keep some notes in there on how much money you've saved the company. What kind of ideas you've had that have worked. Those might be good things to bring up when you go in to negotiate for a raise. You reckon? So don't just get used to taking notes in your classes here. Continue taking notes out of your business as you get out of your business occupation. Okay, when you write your notes, write neatly on one side of the paper. Oh no, we're wasting trees now, aren't we? We're just using half the paper. Well, I think there's probably some other instructors out there that kind of like me, I'll get to go on a long talk about something, then I'll say, oh, by the way, I forgot when I was talking about this back over here a while ago, I should have mentioned also, okay, now you've got stuff all out of sequence, haven't you? You don't have any place to write it in. Flip that page over and put it in there so that it's in sequence with what it should have been on the front of the page. That way, it's going to be in sequence. Things that are in sequence are usually easier to remember. Okay, another thing you can do with your notes. Write them very quickly in class. Abbreviate as much as possible. Make very brief notes. Use your own words, with a few exceptions. When I tell you this is a quote from somebody, or write something on the board, you need to write it down exactly. But when I'm just visiting with you about a subject, write very briefly, write in your own words. You're going to understand them better later. After you leave class, when you've got some time, rewrite your notes. Rewrite them very neatly. A lot of your courses there require notebooks. At least in our department, we make them have a notebook. If those notes are very neat, you know, a neat paper gets better grade than a sloppy written paper. That's just the way it is. You can have the same word, same punctuation, but a neat paper is going to get better grade. Rewrite your notes. What's this done for you? You're wanting to save time, aren't you? Here I'm telling you to write your notes again. Okay. You listened to me talk about it one time. You made notes about it while I was talking. You've been exposed to it twice. You heard it. You wrote it. Okay. When you rewrite it, you're exposed to it a third time. You're using your muscles. You've got a tact, using your tactile senses to write. You're seeing those notes again. It's refreshing your mind again. Now you've studied that same subject three times. How many more times do you think you're going to have to study that before you know it? Not very much. When that test time comes up, you're not going to have much to study because you've already been over it three times. And your notes look neat when you hand in your notebook. And it will save you time in the long run. Study a little bit each day with your notes, rewriting your notes. <clears throat> Try to write your notes in an outline form. Virtually every book that you get, and every lecture that instructor is going to give, they've got an outline sitting up here, don't they? Write your notes in an outline form. If you keep them organized, it's easier to keep them organized in your mind. They normally follow some type of a sequence. <coughs> if you can catch what that sequence is, it makes it easier for you to remember it. Use your own words. They'll make more sense to you. Copy all diagrams, drawings, illustrations. Anytime the instructor goes to the board and writes something down, write down exactly what's there. It takes time to write something on the board. It takes a lot longer to write it than it does for me to say it. If the instructor writes it on the board, you can almost be sure it is going to show up on a test. They think it is important or they wouldn't spend the time writing it up on the board. 
So if it goes on the board, you make a copy of it and copy that exactly. <clears throat> make sure you record correctly any names, dates, places, formulas, equations, etc. If you copy a formula down wrong, everything you use to calculate with it is going to be wrong, isn't it? Make sure that you copy these all down correctly. Write down everything the instructor emphasizes. Write down everything the instructor emphasizes. Now, how do you know when the instructor is emphasizing something? It gets louder or it gets quieter. Or he says it twice, or he says it twice. <laughs> when the instructor listen for it, when the instructor emphasizes something, that's going to be important to you, or at least the instructor thinks it's going to be. So when it's emphasized, write it down. Leave enough space on that page so that you can add some extra notes. Again, that's what the back side of that page should be for, is if you need to add some extra notes. If you miss some notes, you may want to ask your friend who was there in class too. I missed this part of it. Did you catch it? And fill it in. Just leave a place there for you if you know you missed it, so that you can fill it in. That'll help you remind you that you missed something as you was taking those notes. Leave a blank spot for it. Okay. As you rewrite your notes, you probably will come up with some questions. Probably had this happen. You know, it made perfect sense when the instructor was up here showing you how to do it. And you got back there and you started to do it on your own. And it just where'd it go? Now, this this is how I did it step by step. Then you've got a question for the next class meeting, don't you? Find out then. Then you know that you don't know how to do it. Then you can find out the next class period how to do it. And you've accomplished what you've set out to do, to learn all you possibly can in these courses. If you rewrite your notes every time, you'll find those questions. <clears throat> how many times have you been told you just need to study harder. If you just use your time better, you can get something done. Have you ever heard anything like that? Yeah, we all have had it. That doesn't help a whole lot, does it? Now, that's kind of like when you get ready to go out, mom and dad or husband or wife, whatever, says, uh, be careful tonight. You know, that really doesn't help a whole lot either. You're getting ready to go out and drive in traffic. I said, be careful. Well, what if each time you got ready to go out, they gave you a safety rule? I said, okay, now when you're getting ready to make a left-hand turn at the intersection, make sure to keep your wheels straight instead of turning them, because if you're rear-ended, that might push you right out and direct in front of oncoming traffic. Now, would that help you drive more safely and every time they gave you a safety rule just then be careful be careful just kind of flies on by doesn't it it's kind of like study harder well why don't you just get yourself together well how that's what we need to know isn't it? how do we need to study harder most of the time we don't need to study harder we're working off the hard end already we need to know how to study smarter, how to conserve our time, how to get the best use out of the time that we do have. These people have told you these things all mean well, but they just don't help. There's a set of tapes over at the library, call it there's a, uh, where there's a will, there's an A. It takes about three hours to view these tapes. Some evening when there's you don't have homework and there's nothing on TV worth watching these tapes, these tapes you can check out and view there at the library and they've got some more helpful tips 
they don't even charge you the seventy nine ninety five over there. Now, you already paid for it. You might as well take advantage of it and use it. They are helpful tapes. And I'm going to give you a little bit of the stuff that is off of these tapes tonight, but there's a lot more there. We don't have three hours tonight to just cover that information. One thing to talk about that's being aggressive about your education. Your education here is going to cost you at least ten to twelve thousand dollars. Now that new car that you go out and buy for twelve thousand dollars, if you got a rattle, you're going to scream about it, aren't you? You're going to let that service manager know his car that he sold you's got a problem. You should do the same thing about your education. If you're not getting what you paid for, you better let somebody know. You need to be talking to that instructor or that department head or somebody and let them know what you're expecting. You've paid the money. You're the customer here. Now, don't let anybody, don't let anybody know I told you this. This is secret stuff. Now, we wouldn't want to get anything out like this. Be aggressive about your education. You're spending the money. It's going to spend cost you ten or twelve thousand dollars. You're spending that instead of buying that new car. Make sure that this you get rid of all your squeaks and rattles in your education. Make sure you get what you're paying for. Take advantage of any services that are available to you. Work with your instructors, department heads, etc to make sure that you are getting all that you want out of it. Okay. Uh, be persistent. Some of you have gone through registration. They said, well, these classes are closed. Well, I'll tell you another little trick. Don't let anybody know I told you this, though. If you have to have it, and you will work through the channels, work with your advisor, work with your department head. If you really do have to have this, they probably will make room for you. Now, if you just stomp your feet and throw a fit and jump up and down and scream and make everybody mad, you're probably not going to get anywhere. But if you will work with your advisor, your department head, whatever, you can get those classes open sometimes. So be persistent about what you need. Use the tools of big business. What we're talking about tools of big business. How many of you take computer courses? Yeah, that's a tool of big business. Why do business people use it? Because it helps free up time. What about copy machines? What about tape recorders? All of these things help free up time. That's why we use them in business. Use them here. You don't have a lot of extra time either. When they will save you time, use them. Take advantage of it. <clears throat> Neatness on papers counts. Covered that just a little bit. There's been some research done. They took a whole series of, of English papers. They neatly wrote them. And then they typed them. And then they did it, worked them on a word processor. Handed these out to English teachers to grade. Which ones do you think got the best grades? The ones on the word processor. Because with the word processor, you got possibly at least spell checking. You may have grammar checking capabilities. Now, if you've typed this whole page and you see a mistake up here, you're going to change that mistake? You're going to retype that whole page? Probably not. But if it's on that word processor, all you got to do is move that little cursor up there and change the letter. No big deal, is it? Neatness on papers counts. If you want the best possible grade, you'll work your papers on a word processor and take advantage of the spell check and the grammar check and being able to edit that one letter that's wrong. People who sit in the front row get the most attention. 
got a hole full of row there. Well, I'm proud of these folks. For me to get eye-to-eye -eye contact with all of you back there is more difficult than to get eye contact with these people here. If this was a regular classroom with our desk all set in nice little rows, and you had a question back there, you're not as apt to get up and wander through everybody and come down here and ask me a question. But on here in the front row, you, you know, Mr. Ackermeyer? Or you may not want me to come wandering all the way back to the back. But on the front row, it's easy to ask questions. You get the best eye contact. And you know that guy that always sits in front of you that's wearing that cowboy hat? That you're always having to go like this? On the front row, you don't have to look around any hats or big hairdos or whatever. You don't have to look at, you know, that, that spot where it's getting thin back here, that guy that's sitting in front of you. You don't have anything between you and the instructor to distract you. You'll get better information sitting on the front row. Okay. Every once in a while we get a little drowsy sitting in class, don't we? Uh, one thing that can help you is remember that a cat watching a mouse is not getting drowsy. What's that cat doing? It's out there leaned forward, <laughs> muscles tense. It's not getting drowsy, is it? You can do the same thing sitting there at your chair. Lean forward. Set up. Open your eyes. Look at look for that mouse that you're wanting to jump on. That piece of information that's going to come out that you're going to need someday will help you from keeping drowsy in class. Okay, as you read through your notes, now you've written them and you're getting ready to study a little bit. Mark what you don't know. How many of you go through there with the highlighter? Boy, they end up half your book highlighted. You know, this might be important. Well, forget about this that you already know. You don't need to study that anymore, do you? Mark what you don't know. Okay, one of the things that you can do probably better than that is get you some little three by five cards. Write down on that card what you don't know. That way when you're sitting out there in the hallway waiting for the class, waiting for the instructor to show up, you pull out that little card and read what you don't know. And if you read it three or four times, you can be able to throw that card away because you know it now. As you walk across campus from one class to the other, you're wasting time, aren't you? There's nothing going on except transportation. Pull out a card and glance down through there and read over some of the things you don't know. This trick came from a guy that was a roofing contractor. He had three roofing crews going. He was also a full-time student. He didn't have a lot of time to waste. You know, this guy was in business and taking 16 hours too. <coughs> so as he sat out there on the job waiting for the people to show up so he could do a bid on a roof that he needed repaired, he had his cards and he'd go through and look at what he didn't know. And by the time people got there for him to do the bid on the job, he did. He didn't need them anymore. Now this was a businessman that was going to school. He didn't have time to waste. You've already told me you don't have a lot of time to waste. Try some of these things. They will work for you. Told you to study in short bursts. Remember when we talked about that grocery list. Remember the first and the last things. That is the way we remember. We remember the best, the first and last thing we study. So, you start studying and you take a long, very study. You got a high point here, something you're going to remember. Study crossed here a couple hours. You've really dripped down 
get really tired, decide you're going to quit, and the last thing that you study, you're going to remember. If you'll break this up, this two hours up, and it's several ten minute periods, you got a lot more first and last. Now the only problem with this is, you know, make sure you don't get down there at the cup machine and start to visit and, and uh, the time goes by and then it's this time too and you didn't get any first and last. You gotta have a little bit of discipline. Study 10 to 15 minutes. Get up and walk around the room a little bit. Get some exercise. Study another 10 or 15 minutes. Get up and walk around the room. Get a little exercise. Go get a cup. Go whatever. <coughs> Take a break for about three or four or five minutes, come back and do it again. You'll remember a lot more of those first and last. <coughs> okay. How many of you have driven cross country? It was late at night. You started really getting drowsy. Have you ever done that? How did you stay awake when you were driving? That's pretty critical, isn't it? Stay awake while you're driving. How did you do it? Uh, eat something, Love roll the window down, down, got cool, turn the radio up, pull over and stop for a minute. Pull over and stop, walk around. We've got a lot of different techniques to survive when we're driving, don't we? You know those same things will work when you're studying? Now, I worked with a trucking company for 15 years. When our guys got tired, you know, if they just had a little bit further to go, they might get out. Oh, I just, ha, oh, walk up there, oh, wake up, wake up. Yeah. <laughs> By getting that exercise, you know what they've done? they brought more oxygen into their blood system. That oxygen supply has gone into their brain and has enlivened it. When you're sitting there studying, you start breathing shallow. And you're kind of relaxing and you get to the point where you're ready to go to sleep. If you will get up and do some vigorous exercise for just a little bit, you'll get your blood re-oxygenated, re-excited, and you'll be able to stay and study longer. Okay, if you've really been studying hard and you cannot stay awake, if you were driving, what would you do? You'd stop taking a nap, wouldn't you? You know, keep driving off the edge of the road. Boy, now it's time to pull over there and park and take a few little nap. Do the same thing when you're studying. Set that alarm clock and take you a two-hour nap. Instead of studying, you know, cramming until two o'clock in the morning, we'll stop about midnight when you can't, you know, you've read that page three times and you still don't know what it says. It's time to stop. You're wasting time. Go to sleep, set your alarm clock an hour or two early, whatever it thinks you're going to take to get your studying done. And study after you've rested. You're going to save time. That's what it's all about, saving time and getting the most out of the time that you're using. Okay. Another thing you can do is prop your feet up. What's that going to do? It's going to get more blood supply to your head. What do you do when, to treat a person for first aid, treat for shock? Prop up their feet, get more blood to their head. You've got to have oxygen to your brain for it to work properly. The better oxygenated it is, the better it works, the sharper it is. Prop up your feet. It might get you more blood supply to your head. What about that big supper over at the wherever you ate tonight? If you're going to study, you know, I was biology, supposed to be a biology teacher, so I know a little bit about human anatomy and physiology. When you eat that big meal, what happens to your blood supply? It's down here absorbing that food just like it's supposed to be. It's using up that oxygen to oxygen up. Ah, oxidize that food particles. You don't have the, you know, we all get tired after we eat, don't we? 
Remember, Ken Hurley can keep your eyes open to watch the Super Bowl after that turkey. Oh, golly, I need to watch this game. It happens to you. So if you've got a lot of studying to do at night, eat at a light meal. If you're going to be making a long trip at night driving, eat a light meal. You want to stay away. Okay, if you've got just a few more minutes you need to study, you're going to have it whipped, but you're having kind of a sinking spell, get your candy bar, something sweet. But there's a kicker on that sweet. In about 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, the bottom's going to fall out. You're going to get on that sugar high, and as soon as that sugar level drops in your bloodstream, you're going to crash. So that candy bar is only good for about 20 or 30 minutes at the most. Exercise or rest is going to serve you best when you're trying to study. <clears throat> to increase your reading comprehension, you know, I talked about, you know, when you get tired, you've read that three page. You know, you looked over that page three times, you've read it, and you still don't know what's there. We've all been there. Read aloud if you want to increase your reading comprehension. Remember I told you the more senses you use, the better, easier it is to recall something. Read something aloud will help you recall it better. You're using your muscles. You're hearing what was said. You're seeing what was said. You've got that stored in your brain in different locations. You've got a better chance of recalling it. Another thing that you can do is record that while you're reading it out loud, can't you? How many of you commute? Got a few of there commute, yeah. What do you listen to? Country and Western or rock when you come to school? Listen to the news? It'd be real easy to stick that cassette in that you read to yourself last night and read it again while you're driving down the road makes a very easy way to review. How many of you been in B. Dalton's or Walden Books here lately? They've got a whole shelf over there now of tapes. Books on tape. And a whole lot of those are self-help type books. You know, how to be a better salesman, how to be a better this, how to do this better. Why do you think they have those there? Because business people are asking for them. They've got a lot of time going down that road that they would a lot rather be doing something constructive rather than listening to the same old weather again. Use the tools of big business. Okay, another thing you can do if you don't want to read out loud, was you may have somebody there in the dorm room with you and they said, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Call it read actively. Take notes as you read. As you're reading along there, write down questions. Where do you think that instructor is going to get the questions for the test? He's reading that book too and writing down questions. If you write down the questions as you read them, you already know what the test's over, don't you? That's cheating. You're not supposed to know what's on the test. Write down Again, you've used your muscles. You've got more involved in your study. You've used different parts of your brain. You've got it easier to recall that. For you, of course, we're a little late for this semester. But next semester, those first two weeks, launch it all out of tack. Give 110%. If you can buy your books for your course at the end of this semester, you might look through that book and it may look, yeah, hey, this looks like some pretty neat stuff. <coughs> Go ahead and read the first chapter, or first two chapters in that book. Well, it still looks like pretty neat stuff. What does it look like at the end of the semester? Yeah. <laughs> right? <coughs> Am I right? When you first get that book, 
Hey, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Take advantage of that enthusiasm and bang on ahead that first two weeks. When you give 110%, what usually happens? You're successful, aren't you? You do great. Hey, guess what doing great does? It gets to be habit for me. You kind of like to see those A's, don't you? Yeah, everybody likes to see those A's. You, hey, let's try We've got one of them here. Let's see if we can get another one. If you'll start that first two weeks going 110%, it's going to be hard to slow down after that. And we all know what it gets like at the end of the semester. You're burned out, you're tired, you're ready for a break. You know, if you've been really fantastic up here the first semester, some of that momentum is going to carry on through. It'll help you get through that blahs there at the end of the semester. What's the time? Okay. Well, we we'll go ahead and take about a seven minute break. We'll start back about seven o'clock. Probably wound up about 90 to 60 and get it all covered. Oh, I hate that when teachers do that. <laughs> One thing that I forgot in that section that I forgot to bring out was make sure you do all extra credit work. That can easily be the difference between the A and the B. Extra credit work is normally quite easy. How many of you getting extra credit work for being here tonight? Well, tonight you know, might be maybe a bad example. You have to sit here and listen to me. But most of the credit work is very easy to do. And it's very easy for that to be the difference between the A and the B. Always do extra credit work. When the teacher says extra credit, you should have a flag that goes up in your mind and says mandatory. Always do the extra credit work. One here just above that says, don't be late or leave early from classes. Now, you know, we all, you always see the instructor up there, calling roll, tardy, tardy, you know, here, here. <coughs> That's not what I'm worried about. As an instructor, before I give a test, sometimes I let the test over the night before, and I, ooh, I forgot to mention this in my lectures. And boy, I better recover this before we get that test out. So before class really gets going good, I'll go ahead and oh, by the way, yesterday we was talking about so and so. We needed to. I need to tell you this, and I forgot to. And here comes in a couple more guys, and I said, okay, well let's go ahead and take your test now. Those couple guys that walked in late, they missed out. Now, I didn't plan on cheating them out of that question, but they were there late. Everybody else that was there on time got that information. If you leave early, especially after taking a test, you know, you want to get be the first one to have your paper up on the desk and out the door. Consistently, those first papers are not the best papers. If you're one of those people that doesn't get the first one up there, don't worry about it. Consistently, the first papers to hit the teacher's desk are not the best ones. Don't worry about it. Take your time. There's a funny thing about instructors. We seem to be in this business because we like to share our knowledge. Now, if you're sitting there taking the test, most of the people are got gone, and, you know, there's half a dozen of you sitting there in class still, Somebody says, hey, I, I really don't understand this question number 16. Now, what, what do you really mean on this? Well, instructors have bad habits. Well, you know, I bet, you know, it, pretty soon you start giving hints. You know, because we have a real hard time. We want to share this knowledge. Those five or six people that were left there in class got took advantage of that, didn't they? I didn't plan on cheating everybody that had left. That was not my intention. But I needed to clarify what the question was. But those people that were still left in class got the advantage, didn't they? Those that left early did not get the advantage. So stay there throughout the whole period. 
make sure you check your test out. Okay, taking educated guesses, the next section there. This is talking about times when you have studied and you know your material, but all of a sudden there is something there that just out of the blue, you had no idea you needed to study for it. Uh, let's just make a guess at it. These are things that have been done after studies of nationalized or standardized tests. These are some tips that if you know them well enough, they have done some research on this, have taught these people how to use these steps and give them a standardized test over something they had no idea about, nothing in the world, never studied it, and by guessing correctly, achieved 70% or better. By guessing correctly. So, Take a look at these tips. You may not be able to remember them all this time. That's why we've got a handout for you. So you can take a look back over some of these. See which ones will work for you. These help you eliminate. Make your odds better. First one there says multiple choice. When two out of the four answers are opposites, pick one of the opposites. Pretty simple. If there are two out of the four opposites, it's <coughs> one of the opposite. It's probably the right answer. Now your odds have gone from one in four to one in two. Much better odds. Okay, number two, B, C, and D answers are the best in a five answer question. Normally, B, C, or D is the correct answer. Now instead of one chance out of five when you guess, you've got one chance out of three. Avoid pairs. We've heard that ever since grade school. If this answer is B, don't make the next one B if you're guessing. <clears throat> That's one that we've heard for a long time. Non-answers. Zero. None of the above. Are not good choices. Normally, when a test is written, it should be used to help educate also, to help refresh your memory. If none of the above answers is correct, that didn't help achieve that, did it? So none of the above or zero is normally a poor answer to guess at. Questions asking for the most or least. Normally choose the next to the most number or the next to the least number as shown in your example there. If it asked for the most, and we had a 4, 8, 9, 15, and 30, pick the 15. It's next to the most in the answers. Psychologically, when they get these questions get written, this has a better chance of being the correct answer. Now, I've given all the secrets away. This is psychology of writing tests. These are how it just happens to work out because we're people. Here I'm letting cheat on tests just by learning some psychology. Okay, all the above is generally a good guess. All of the above is generally a good guess. If something just doesn't reach out and slap you upside the face as being bad, it's generally a good guess. The longest multiple choice answers are usually good guesses. Why would you think that? It's got the most information, the most detail, doesn't it? So the longest multiple choice answers are usually a best, a good guess. Okay, if two out of the four choices are almost identical, pick the longest of the two. Why? It's got more detail. <coughs> Okay, if a few questions have five possible answers and everything else only has four, pick the fifth one. As I was going back over this test I'd just written, I got to this one, it's, well, that's not right, that's not right, C's not right, D's not right, that gimmick, they'll put an E in there with the right answer. It happens. 
So it, almost all the choice, all the questions have four choices, and this one's got five. He's probably a good choice. <clears throat> if a question asks for a plural or a singular answer, make sure you give it a plural or singular answer. What about those fill in the blank questions? I, mean, I didn't have this one on there. Now, if you got a question along there that says, you know, ask your question A blank, what's that word going to start with? Um, consonant. Yeah. It's going to be a cat or a dog. It's going to start with a consonant, isn't it? If it says an, it's going to start with a vowel, like an apple. Most teachers use fairly decent English. There's another little tip for you. If you got A, it's not going to be A apple or A amoeba. So it's pretty science room. Make sure that you're using proper English in that fill in the blank. Or picking the word that goes in there. Okay, when limiting words such as all, never, always are used in the question, it's not a good, or used in an answer, it's not a good answer. How many things do you know in life that are always? Or are never? There's all shades of gray in there. So when it limits it like that, it's not very apt to be true. There's almost always an exception. Okay. General terms like most, some, usually, possibly, whatever, those are good choices. Because most things in life are that way. Exaggerated or complex answers are generally false. Okay, you may have a hard time distinguishing between that exaggerated answer and that multiple choice, that longest multiple choice answer that has the most detail. But again, we're trying to get, we're trying to cut down the odds. Some of this depends on your instructor, how they write their tests. By knowing how they write, you will know what you need to answer back. You need to study their tests. Okay. Answer every question, even if it's a best guess. Never, ever, 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 and this one doesn't have any exceptions, leave it blank. Even if you write something silly in there, the instructor may get a chuckle in the middle of the night when you drain those papers and give you partial credit. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Well, I'll give a couple points for that. Always fill in every answer. On essay tests, write as much as possible. Write short paragraphs. We know that when we write paragraphs, every paragraph has different information in it, doesn't it? Well, even if you're saying the same thing in this second paragraph you did in the first paragraph, only changed it around a little bit, it still looks like you knew, doesn't it? Psychologically, every paragraph makes it look like you knew more about that topic. You can write one whole page, and it's got one indention in there. That's one whole paragraph. Well, you knew one thing about that topic, didn't you? But if you'll write three or four sentences and, and then again and then again with paragraphs, it looks like you do a lot of different information about that topic. Still didn't have to write anymore. But you just made it psychologically more appealing. Psychologically, it looked like you knew more. <clears throat> okay, on essay exams, a lot of volume. Write very clearly, plainly, express yourself clearly. 
and neatness pays off. If you're going to go into an essay exam, <coughs> you've got to take in a blue book or you're going to be handed a piece of paper or whatever, take in an erasable pen with you. If you're going to have one chance to write it, make it look as neat as possible. A paper that's got stuff scratched out looks bad. Looks like you didn't know what you were talking about. You changed your mind. You can use one with erasable ink. And it shows a little bit, but it doesn't show near as much as that scratch out did. It doesn't look as bad psychologically again. Now is this right that a neat paper gets a better grade than a sloppy paper? No, it's not right. It's not fair. Nobody ever told you the world was fair, did it? So use it to your advantage. If you know there is an advantage there, use it. Okay. Reread your directions before you hand in a test. Don't be in a hurry to hand it in. For example, make sure you compare or didn't compare instead of uh, define. Make sure you follow your directions. I have seen a couple tests around here. They've got a whole page of instructions. I mean, that whole page there is instructions. And you read down there. I don't need to read all these. You flip over, you start working on these 100 page, 100 question tests. Well, if you'd read down here at the bottom, it said if you've read all these instructions, sign your name here and leave. If you didn't read all the instructions, you're back here working for two hours answering questions. Doesn't make any type of business, any type, any difference what kind of business you're going to go into. <coughs> Reading instructions is very important. And that's what these instructors have been trying to get across. Read all of your instructions before you start into a project. Know what you're supposed to do before you get started. Okay. Answers sometimes pop into your head as you're going through a test. Never change one of those answers. If it just, boom, pops out of the blue, never change it. Because it's probably right. That is your subconscious. All that stuff that's back here that you can't get up in your conscious to recall, your mind still got it back there and it's working. And something just kind of flashes in your mind Write her down. That's probably the right answer. Never change it. Never change a first guess. Okay. Never turn your homework in late, sloppily done, or unedited. Another way to get good grades. How easy is it to edit a paper that you've just written? It's real tough, isn't it? Because you knew what you meant to say there. Because it's real tough to edit your own paper. If you want to get A papers, have a friend edit your paper. Have them look for the spelling error and the punctuation error and do the same thing for them. They don't know what you meant to write there. They know what you wrote there. It's very difficult to edit your own work. Have someone help you. Or if you can't get someone to help you, write it, lay it aside, go do something else. An hour or two be fine. A day or two would be better. Then go back and reread it. Now you've got a better chance of reading what is really on the paper instead of what you meant to put on the paper. Okay, there are five steps here to better writing skills. Five steps to better writing. <coughs> this is another business trick. This isn't one the English teacher is going to tell you about. <coughs> 
How many of you ever been at a business meeting or seen people at a business meeting and the guy's got his napkin up here on the table, you know, just writing like the Dickens? Well, you do the same thing when you got a writing assignment. While you're sitting over there eating supper and something pops in your head right down the corner of the napkin. Now, you, if you're going to write a page, you may have four or five paragraphs there. Or three pages, you may end up five or six different topics you want to write about. Well, write these, scribble these five or six ideas you know, on the corner of the napkin. Okay, now you've got what you want to write about. The next thing you need to do then is write a topic sentence for each of those items. Your topic sentence normally is going to be the first sentence in your paragraph, isn't it? What am I going to talk about about this subject? The next one is the real trick. And we kind of learned this by working with computers. But if you go in there on your first page paper, up here, write your topic sentence for your first paragraph. And then skip down the middle of that page and write the topic sentence for your second paragraph. And on down, just about one sentence on each page. You'll be writing along up here on this, and you're going to have some type of fantastic idea come to your mind that needs to go down here. Well, now you can just drop down there and write it. How many of you have had one of those flashes come, boy, that'd be great on down here a ways, and you go ahead and write, try and write here in this row, and by the time you get down here, you forgot what that fantastic idea was? Those flashes, again, is your subconscious. Those are some very good ideas. You need to pay attention to those. So if you'll lay this out, a topic sentence on about a half a page, then you can bounce around just like you could on that computer from this screen to the next screen, page one, page two, page three. And you'll get some fantastic writing down. Okay, after you've got it all written out now, now you can go back, edit it, make it flow like it needs to, you'll polish it up a little bit. Fifth step then, I think, is to let somebody else edit it. Edit your paper or let somebody else edit your paper. These are steps business people use. What do we need to accomplish in this meeting? Just write those out on the edge of that paper. That on that note, that napkin on the table. And then go on through these steps so you can write a good paper. Okay, when you're trying to memorize something, you look at you, some of these tips, or if you're going back over the same old way you learned your ABCs, you know, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and you just kept going up. Then you had a lot of time, didn't you? When you was three years old, you had all kinds of time. You could spend that time going A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. You don't have that kind of luxury now. Learn some of these techniques that will help you memorize quickly. Even if you don't have a technique, make sure you're well rested when you try to memorize something. If you try to memorize something while you're sleepy and tired, you're wasting your time. And you've already told me you don't have time to waste. So don't try to memorize while you're tired and worn out. If you're gonna have to memorize something, wait till you're rested and alert. Build your own library. Now is the time to start building your library. You are working in a special field right now that you have chosen. Keep your textbooks. Now is the time to start checking out B. Dalton's and Walden books and over at this library and down at the city library on how to be the best salesman, the best secretary, the best mechanic, the best parts, and you know, whatever, how to be the best person you can be. Now is the time to start reading those books. Also, right now, even if this is your first semester, is the time to start reading books on how to write a resume. And even if you don't read the whole book, read the resumes. 
you might be a, it might be really great to say you know that line right there really fits me I'm going to copy that one down I believe that would look good on my resume flip back up hey there's another sentence that would look good on my resume and it really fits me too and I would never thought of word it that way It's not going to be long before you need that resume. Look at somebody else's works to see how you can improve yours. Okay, a good diet, correct vitamins, minerals, exercise, all these things are going to help your study skills. It's been shown in, in studies with older people, uh, that have basically lost their memory, especially when they're trying to cook for themselves. How many of you love to cook for one person right now? It's a real pain, isn't it? It's a lot easier to cook for four or five. Now, these older people, they've, used, they've had a family, they've been raised, now it's down to two, maybe just one person. It's tough to cook for just one or two people. And they quit eating right, quit eating properly. You may have quit eating properly. Now mom or dad not taking, you know, sit down here and eat some supper. You know, grab a sandwich and Fritos and go on. These older people, after they have been brought in and fed well, their memories begin to recover. Proper vitamins, proper minerals, you need them to have good memories. So eat well, eat good balanced meals. It will help your education. Okay, well I'm going to skip a couple things here on improving the interpersonal relations there. I think most of those you can read and make a lot of good sense. Treat your roommate as neat. Hey, it's a good idea. Whether your roommate has to be a wife or a husband or whatever. Treat them as an equal. Respect your roommate's right to privacy. Keep borrowing to a minimum. In fact, if you don't have to, you don't borrow. There's one down here, and like I said, I'll go over these and uh, let you read through some of them. But that number 12 down there. Prepare to live on a realistic money budget. <coughs> Prepare to live on a realistic budget. You're adults now. You're going to have to live on your money that you've got. <coughs> if you keep bumming money off your buddy or keep calling back home and say send me another 20 or another 100, you are advertising that you are not capable of handling your financial affairs. Set your budget and try to live it. We all have times when we need some extra money. Something unexpected. You know, this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about every Tuesday, Mom and Dad can plan on getting a phone call that says, send me another 50. Plan your budget and work with it. Now, why not talk about budgets? What's that going to do about your study? If you've got something else on your mind, it's hard to study it. It's real hard to study if you get something else on your mind that you're worried about. Number 13 there, we encourage you to join activities, but don't become so active in clubs and organizations and outside activities that you can't take care of your school. This is your business right now. This is what's going to earn you money later on. Take care of it right now. The reason why I skipped over this a little bit is I want to get into this last portion right here. Something I feel very strongly about. Many of you probably heard of Dale Carnegie. He came to this nation as an immigrant with not much more than his clothes on. Now, there's little things like Carnegie Hall. I think there's several hundred, maybe several thousand Carnegie libraries throughout the nation. The man became very, very wealthy. And these are some of the tips he had for getting along with people. It says become a friendlier person. Now, does this have to do with school or does this have to do with business? Was he a teacher or was he a businessman? 
Here's a businessman way. You're wanting to be business people too, aren't you? Well, this not only works at school, it'll work at business. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Very strong first statement. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Be a problem solver, not a problem watcher. Give honest, sincere appreciation. If something does, if someone does a kindness for you, tell them thank you. Be appreciative of that. Of it. Arousing others an eager want to. That's kind of a little different way of wording things there. When you want something done, make it a win-win situation. If you do this for me, we both win. Now, if you go to the car salesman and he sells you a good car, it serves you for five or six, seven years. He won because he got commission off of it. You won because you had a good car, something that served your needs very well. It was a win-win situation. Every dealing you have some with someone, try to make it a win-win situation where both of you win. Then everybody's happy. Become genuinely interesting people. Know the people you're working with. Know your classmates. Know your roommates. Know your teachers. Become interested in them. Have you ever seen a salesman that came in over two or three times that didn't know the people's names? A successful salesman? You know, he's going to know that the son is out there on the football team and the daughter's the cheerleader and, the, and he's going to ask all these questions. Be interested in the people you're working with. Right now you're working with other students and instructors. Be interested in what they're doing. Okay. Smile. It's amazing what it can do for you. You can choose your attitude for today. You can choose to be happy today. Or you can choose to be sad or mad or upset today. Choose to be happy. It will make your day go a lot easier. It will make your life a lot better and everybody's life that surrounds you a lot better. Remember a person's name is the sweetest sound they hear. Always try to remember people's names. If you can call a person by name, you're already halfway there in <coughs> having a good relationship. You never see a salesman that comes in and say, well, I need to see your boss on what's his name. Well, if he is, he's not going to be a salesman for long. He's going to be starving to death. Use people's names. It's the sweetest thing they know. Sweetest sound of their ears. Talk in terms of other people's interest. You want to be a good conversationalist? If they're really interested in something else, you know, learn something about it and talk to them about it. Make other people feel important and do it sincerely. Every one of you has a special talent. Every one of you is a special person. You know the special things that you do. Watch for the special things that the person next to you does. The person you're around it. And learn to appreciate the special things that they can do. Okay. Win ways. Win. How do you win people to do the things your way? But we all want people to do things our way, don't we? The only way to get the best out of an argument is don't have it. The only way to win an argument is don't have it. Show respect for other people's opinions. Now, if I ask you a question in class and you gave me an answer, I that is so stupid. I can't believe you said something. How can you be that ignorant and be in college? How would you feel? Pretty low, wouldn't you? Yeah, you may want to grab my neck 
cut my head off, whatever. You can't do that. Respect other people's opinions. If you don't agree and you're an authority, let them know that it was a respected opinion. You did respect their opinion, but you think this other idea will work. And tell them why. When you get into management, and many of you are destined for it, you're going to have to listen to other people's opinions. And you may not agree with them. But you do need to listen because somebody's going to have a good idea. Respect their opinions. Don't blow them out of the water when they give an opinion. Or pretty soon, you won't have any opinions. If I responded to each of your questions that way, pretty soon nobody would answer when I asked a question, would they? If you want other people's opinions and you want the information and the knowledge they have, don't criticize their opinions. If you're wrong, admit it. Admit it emphatically. I mean, I gave up one of my classes last semester. I had a guy that just kept irritating me, just pushed me to the edge. And one day I said, right in the middle of class, you stopped, looked at him right in the face, and said. If you don't like what I'm doing, there's the door. And I was just serious as a heart attack. I humiliated him right there in class. And that was wrong. He was a big enough man though he came in when we had a break. He said, please don't humiliate me like that. I said, that was wrong with me, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was. When I went back in class, I told, I made a point. And this is one of my upper level classes I teach. I said, one of these days you're going to be in management. If you're going to criticize somebody, criticize them in private. Praise in public. Criticize in private. I said, I criticized in public. I need to apologize in public. And I apologized to him. I did this wrong. I handled it improperly. I want all of you to know. If you do something wrong, admit it emphatically. Get it out in the open. Get the hurt feelings over with so you can continue on with what needs to be done. <clears throat> okay, let's jump on down there. Fundamentals for overcoming work. Many of you have worries. These are some ways to get work, try to work out of it. If you're worried about what's going on, you can't study with. If you're worried about problems at home, you may be a safety hazard. <coughs> okay, live in daytime compartments. What does that mean? That means yesterday's already gone. We can't change it. There's no use worrying about yesterday. There's nothing we can do about it. Tomorrow's not here yet. We can do the best we can so that tomorrow will be successful, but there's no use worrying about tomorrow. It's not here yet. Today's got enough. Don't worry about yesterday or tomorrow. How do you face trouble? First thing you do is ask yourself, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? What is the worst possible thing that could happen because of this? And then decide to accept it. Then accept that it's going to happen. And then after you accept that it's going to happen, try the best you can to make it not happen. Don't worry about it. See what you can do to change the outcome. But if you accept that this worst is going to happen, then you don't have to worry about it. You can go on with your life. Try to improve on what that worst is then. Okay. Worry has an extreme high cost in health. Think about what it's going to cost you to worry about. How much is that test worth worrying over? 
Should I worry about this test for 30 minutes? Is it worth 30 minutes of worry? Or should I worry about it for an hour? Or you know, the kids didn't get home at 10 o'clock. They're supposed to be here at 10.30. How much longer should I worry? Make a decision. How much worry is this problem worth? Give it that and say, out of the way. Worrying doesn't solve anything. Looking for a solution may solve a problem, but worrying about it does not solve it. It wastes time. Don't worry about something. Or if you are just one of those that just has to worry, decide how long you're going to worry about it, get it over with and get it behind you. <clears throat> to analyze what you're worried about, get all the facts. Is it worth worrying about? Get the facts about it. Weigh all the facts and then come to a decision. Hey, this almost sounds like a business meeting, doesn't it? Get all the facts, weigh the facts, come to a decision. Once the decision is reached, act upon it. Hey, if you, pro if you do a business meeting this way, you get something done, don't you? Write out the answers to the following questions. What is the problem? When you decide, when you really define the problem, you may be halfway to solving it. What are the causes of the problem? Hey, this sounds like diagnostics. What's the problem? What are the possible causes of the problem? What are possible solutions? What is the best solution? And then act on it. Hey, that sounded like a business meeting, didn't it? I mean, you can use business stuff for personal worries. Yeah, you can. If you use those solutions, those steps right there, you can have a good business meeting, too. You will get something done in your meeting. Instead of sitting in there two hours, you go, what do we do this for? Okay, break that worry out before it breaks you. Keep busy. If you're worried about something, if you get busy, you don't have time to worry about it. Don't fuss about trifles. Don't worry about the dadgum toothpaste cap. Who cares whether it was put on or off? Now, I could do another one that I get a lot of booze about. Well, y'all like it. Who cares whether the, the lid's up or down? <laughs> Except in the middle of the night in the dark. I know. I know. <laughs> How many divorces are over some little stuff like this? Most of them. If you really get down to it, those little things, those little irritating, irritating things that are not really worth worrying about are what causes a lot of divorces. Company breakup, partnerships collapsing. Those little things are important in our minds. But if you're the one that's worried about the little thing, really decide how important it is. <coughs> is it worth tearing down what we've built because of this little thing? Okay. Use the law of averages to outlaw your worries. When I moved up to Oklahoma City a couple of years ago, parts manager for Mack Truck up there, my wife was living down in Texas. I rented an apartment. I'd lived there almost three days before I had a drive-by shooting. My wife said, come home. Get out of Oklahoma City. I got a good job here. Why would I want to do that? But they shot at your apartment. I said, there's a lot of apartments in Oklahoma City. What's the chance they're going to do it again? You know, they're going to hit somebody else's apartment next time. What are the chances that it's going to happen? Work the odds. I didn't worry about it. Didn't sit in front of that window as much as I used to. <laughs> Don't worry about the past. There's nothing you do to change the past. If you have hurt somebody's feelings, if you've injured somebody, the only thing you can do about it is ask for forgiveness or apologize and go on with your life. But you can't continually worry about it. 
cultivate a mental attitude that brings you happiness. I told you you can choose if you want to be happy or if you want to be angry. Choose to be happy. Choose to put that smile on your face in the morning. You can choose it. Fill your minds with happy thoughts. Remember, I told you, research has shown that everything you have read, everything you have seen, everything you have done, everything you have smelled is in your mind and affects you every day. <coughs> Fill your mind with pleasing, happy, pleasant thoughts. We already have enough of that other junk there. So when you have a choice, please put pleasing, happy, pleasant things in your mind instead of the gym. Never try to get even with your enemies. It'll always backfire. Expect ingratitude. When you get to the business place, I don't care what you're going to do, you're probably going to say, I did a good job. Why didn't somebody pat me on the back? <coughs> Expect nobody to pat you on the back. They're not going to take time to do it. You did a good job because you were hired to do a good job. Why should they pat you on the back for doing the job like you're supposed to? Expect that. Then when somebody comes by and says, good job, it really feels good. But you don't get down when they don't come by. Expect not to be told good job. Then when you get it, it really feels good. When you don't get it, it doesn't ruin your day. Count your blessings, not your troubles. Try to profit from your losses. <coughs> Every time you make a mistake in class, you probably learn more from that mistake than all the right things you did. Learn from your mistakes and profit from them. Don't worry about it. We all make mistakes. Create happiness for others. One well, of the best things you can do to make your life successful is do something for someone that can do nothing for you. Do something for someone that can do nothing for you if you want to bring joy to your life. I think I'll go ahead and close it there tonight. The rest of it, I think, is probably pretty well self-explanatory. We've gone through a lot of little tips and tricks, or a few little tips and tricks. Want to go over how not to worry, because I see a lot of worried faces sometimes. And it eats and spins up a lot of time that they need to be used to study. I hope this has been enjoyable for you. Thank you very much for coming.